Carl Werner, who will be talking to you about technology development for a K-band wide field imaging array. So take it away, Carl. Okay, I'm just getting my desktop arranged. First, I'll just pause for a minute and then uh, maybe you can let me know if the video is coming through, the audio is good. Yep, everything looks good on our side. Wonderful. Well, I wish I could be there in person, but I'm glad to be able to participate remotely. I hope it's been a good meeting for everyone so far. Uh, you can see the title of my talk. The cover page is a little bit dishonest because just uh, maybe out of laziness, I only put my name there, but this is really representative of a large collaboration, really too many graduate students and colleagues to name. You can see some of the collaborators that have helped us develop the technology I'll be talking about in this presentation. Here's an overview of the talk. You can see the things we'll go through. Really, the premise is if we were really going to build a K-band phase array feed, what would we do um, mainly with the digital back end? And I'll talk a little bit about some things that overlap with what Kevin just talked about in his excellent talk. OK, just to prime the pump, here's what I had in mind as I was thinking about design considerations. Some of these questions I'll address at length in the presentation. Others are just uh, little ticklers for further thought. Bandwidth, um, you know, I'm just targeting traditional K-band, but of course, that's open to discussion. Um, the uh, front end, the antenna elements would, of course, have to cover most of K-band. That means a relative bandwidth of 40%, which drives the antenna design. That's a little bit larger than the current L-band phase array feed that my group is building with Cornell University, Halpaca, that I'll talk about um, quite a bit in just a minute. So that kind of bounds the antenna design problem. Cryogenics, the basic question is where to put the, the uh, thermal transition. Alpaca has a vacuum window that is in front of the array elements so the antenna elements are cooled which minimizes the effect of antenna losses on the noise temperature but of course uh, that means a much larger cooling volume the vac vacuum window has to be mechanically supported um, thousands of pounds of pressure and so forth the alternative would be to cool the electronics as was done in the flag array that you saw a picture of just briefly in kevin's talk and then have a a, an electronic thermal transition in the in the RF connection between low noise amplifiers and the elements. Um, the smaller size of a K-band array sort of moves the consideration towards cooling the whole thing, including the antenna elements. So I think that's kind of the baseline design strategy. Then the question becomes how to lay out the array. Um, I've done many design studies for applications, mostly at lower frequencies, um, usually a hexagonal array configuration um, wins out over rectangular. Um, you'll see that a little bit with the alpaca slides that I'll show. Um, the horn element would be the normal first choice as the frequency goes up into the tens of gigahertz and above, but I'll talk about another option there. Um, the Gregorian focus, I think, is the natural assumption but I'm personally interested in looking myself at what would happen at prime focus um, at higher frequencies. And we can get a little bit higher gain with a modest size array and um, maybe illuminate the disk directly. Um, anyway, just, just some things to think about there under the array element, the array and the element design. A big issue is calibration stability. I have a couple of slides on a millimeter wave phased array feed that was briefly tested on the GBT. And that raises an issue with uh, calibrating the beamformer weighting coefficients for a K-band array. Is it more like L-band where things work great or more like W-band where there's a significant challenge? Signal transport, uh, Kevin already alluded to the basic question there. Do we digitize at the dish? and reduce the aggregate number of fibers. So if we packetize all the bits, we might be able to use uh, just a few fibers, whereas with RF over fiber, we need something more on the order of the number of array elements and polarizations. And then the digital back end. And really, most of my talk is on the digital side. Well, so I'll have a lot to say there. Um, 
I have plenty of time in my talk for questions. So as I go through this, I, I have the Zoom chat window up. So if you post a question, I can read it directly. Or if someone wants to vocalize the question over the audio, I'm happy to take questions at any time throughout the talk. So please just jump in. Just a quick overview of some of the prominent phased, phased array feed projects going on around the world. And nestled in the center of my images is uh, Rick Fisher's early phased array feed, um, quite ahead of its time in many ways. And that was done in the early 90s. And that's grown into many efforts worldwide. Uh, BYU worked with the UMass to put a W-band phased array feed on the GBT, uh, very much a prototype system. Um, the UMass part was very impressive, micro-machined, um, the small size of the antenna elements and electronics was a significant challenge. Um, front end, I, I think, worked quite well. 64 elements, eight by eight array. Um, you can see that each element was a dual horn, and that was designed to optimize the um, illumination pattern of each element in both orthogonal directions. Integrated in the feed were SIGI uh, mimics for the LNAs, uh, custom chips, a fairly good noise temperature, um, and then down converters to an L band IF. And then uh, my group provided the digital back end and the beam forming. Uh, here's the digital signal processing. Uh, you can see we use Roach boards, part of the Casper framework that I'll talk about quite a bit in a few slides. Um, a network switch to distribute data so that each array element can be combined with all the others. And um, then PCs to do the final processing and, and storage. Really the fundamental issue at W-band was calibration stability. Uh, as the dish moved, gravitational Flexing changed, wind and temperature drift. There are a variety of sources for um, changes in the response in phase and gain of each array element that made calibrating the array uh, really challenging. It wasn't really even clear whether the, the array could be calibrated long enough to remain stable within just one several minute observation. We, we observed a lot of drift. We were able to form some images enough to vet the system, but if there were a production science capable, array on the dish at this frequency, we'd have to do something with calibration, like having a vertex or apex radiators on the dish surface that would send a periodic signal that would be introduced in the signal chain and then used to recalibrate the array within an observation. So there's plenty of good solutions to the array calibration drift available, but they'd have to be explored in future work. I'm going to leave the W band work, so I'll just pause a minute, catch my breath, and invite a question or two or a comment if there are any. So, how, what's your uh, desire? If you did do a calibration, would you do a wide band calibration or a tone that you would try to track on the surface of the dish? Sure. So, this prototype system, the beam forming bandwidth was tens of megahertz, so very narrow, but I think you're asking about a production system. I don't know. Um, it might have to be a comb. So we'd have maybe a dozen tones over a few gigahertz of bandwidth. You know, if we had a digital backend capable of forming beams over a wider band, it's possible this could be done with a noise source, but it'd have to be high enough above the thermal background to be able to, you know, dominate when we extract the phase calibrations. D does that answer the question or, or do you want to follow up? I think it does. When the MIT group always used a tone, which is always sort of orthogonal to the NRAO wave or the DBO wave, which is to use a, a noise source or broadband. Yeah, in this system, we use the calibration method that's typical at L band, and that's having the telescope dwell in a bright calibrator source. So as far as you know, the BYU backend beam forming recalibrated with a with a point source. So the, the tone would be on top of that. We, we would maybe calibrate on a point source and then inject the tone periodically during an observation, to sort of refresh those, the beam former weights. And Jim, you have a question? Yeah, I had a question. Go, going back to your idea of, of putting the face ray feed in the prime focus, I uh, hadn't really heard or, or thought about that idea before. And I was wondering, is that um, 
could, could you imagine that happening commensal with one of the existing prime focus feeds or would that require like a full maintenance day and, and dedication to that feed as the other prime focus uh, systems do? I'm hoping there's someone in the audience who could probably address that better than I do. You know, the commensal thing I don't know about, the, the physics of putting the feed at one place or the other, I'm very interested in. Um, that, well, I will say there was some talk of putting the alpaca L-band phased array feed, just briefly a little bit of discussion about putting that actually at Gregorian focus to sort of reduce the pressure at prime focus. So actually based on that discussion, having the K-band phased array feed at Gregorian would be better. But then again, I'm just, that's all second or third hand for me. And maybe there's someone there who can talk more intelligently. There, there are a number of issues with putting a high frequency receiver at prime focus. First of all, it wasn't designed for it. So we don't know, for example, uh, feedability and uh, things of that nature. Um, Focal ratio is much lower, so things like um, uh, motion of the, of the pointing of the fins goes up by a factor of three. So a you know, 150 so 150 gigahertz receiver is like observing a 300 gigahertz in the wind. And, then, and there are other other things like um, the feed arm bends slightly sideways at an elevation of the scale waivers on one side, and so but there is no motion in prime focus to move. To counter that, and so collimation goes down. And so the higher in frequency you go, the worse that collimation is, and the more the loss and gain you will have from having coma. Um, so it's not impossible. It just means that you have things that need to be worked out in much more detail than just saying prime focus is a good place to put something. Thank you. I, Other I questions? Think ahead as far as scheduling wise. We have a future where you have you know gale band face rate feed and ultra wide band with the pulsar work. You're getting this instrument up like once every two months for a week or something like that. So you're taking like a factor of 10 hit efficiency of when you can observe that sort of might counteract all your gains and how fast you can map. Yeah, that's why I was asking about the commensal possibility. So putting another receiver. That is off to the side. My focus means that you then um, this is a phase of rage, so you can actually um, uh, phase up your feeds to reproduce a better baseline. So I'm uh, sorry, a better beam shape. And so it may be possible to put a a, a, a array, uh, a phase array off to the side of my focus receiver, and actually get good beam shapes. Um, You might also be looking at having to redesign the TP or something like that a little bit. I think you need another boom. Or go in that direction anyway. What would be a requirement? Another receiver up there. And I like the Sardinia configuration for prime focus where they can have three prime focus receivers up there simultaneously. You just slide them back. Get the one you want at the focal point. And that looks like that's all the comments in the room. So. Thank you. Uh, now I'm going to transition from W band down to L band and talk a little bit about alpaca. Uh, the front end is a hexagonal array, 69 uh, dual polarization dipoles, all under a vacuum window, as mentioned. One clever innovation. From the front end designers was a three-fold symmetry to uh, reduce fabrication and design complexity. We call those triants. Signal transport RF over fiber with an injected calibration tone. Um, that, that's kind of a just-in-case backstop. We don't normally need that at L band, but we built in the capability um, if we did need it. Lots of adjustable attenuation in a multi-channel system. There can be 10 dB or more of gain variation and a high gain receiver system from channel to channel. So we have lots of places to level gain. The digital back end, um, I'm, I won't really dwell on this much since I have several slides to follow up on this, but that gives you a brief overview of, of the back end. <coughs> Here's a system overview, uh, front end, cryostat, cooling, LNAs, 
signal conditioning and signal transport, RF over fiber. That's a fiber bundle with multiple strands. Uh, um, Jansky lab in signal conditioning, um, variable gain stages and so forth. Digitization, um, beam former uh, correlator engines, and then the and then the science outputs. Here's a view of the array itself. Again, it's hexagonal. Uh, you can see the dipoles. They are under foam, which is fairly RF transparent and supports the weight of the vacuum window, uh, which is HDPE. Here's uh, one of the fabricated dipole sections in their mounting plates. So you can see that's coming together. They're designed to be removable in case there's a, and modular with LNAs in case there's a failure of uh, one of the many cryogenic amplifiers. Here's the RF over fiber. Um, these boards are in production. They've gone through many design stages. They're multi-channel, um, work very nicely. Uh, you can see the transmit board and the receive board. The receive board is uh, is a daughter board that plugs onto an RF sock for digitization. Here's a functional overview of the uh, digital back end. You can see the Xilinx RF sock boards, packetizers uh, running on the FPGA, then uh, 100 GB, GBE Ethernet through a switch, and then that distributes to a rack or multiple racks of HPCs with GPUs where the correlation of beamforming is done and images are created. Uh, here's the actual DSP block diagram uh, for one of the modes. This is fine spectrometer mode. There's a coarse spectrometer that happens in the FPGAs, which is not shown here. The FPGAs um, send data to the Ethernet switch, and then that again is broadcast to HPCs and GPUs. On the GPU, the coarse channelized data is being formed, and then uh, a fine filter bank is, uh, is done for um, high frequency resolution, some integration, and then a data product output. Another mode, this is calibration. Instead of beamforming, we correlate. This would be with the telescope pointing at a bright calibrator source. From those correlations, we do matrix processing and get the beamformer coefficients or beams for all the pixels formed by the array. I won't dwell on these slides too much. This is really just to get the detailed specs of the back end into the conference record. I will take questions about these if anybody has any. And there's a pulsar mode, uh, pulsar and transient mode. Uh, fine spectrometer mode, calibration mode, um, a few more specs. There's some modes that are kind of on the wish list. We don't have support to produce them, but those could be done with some programming time. That's one of the advantages of having a flexible software-based digital backend. This is something that might be of interest to some in the group. One of the problems with doing the spectrometer in two modes is that um, the standard approach doesn't really work. If we do a standard coarse polyphase filter bank, which is what's needed to prime the beamformer, we have to channelize and then do the array beamforming. But those channels are too wide to give us enough frequency resolution, right? The, the science is done in frequency bins that are much smaller than the beamforming. If we just do a traditional polyphase filter bank and then a fine filter bank, we get gaps in the spectrum at the overlap points in the, in the first course channelizer. So we put quite a bit of work into overcoming that problem. The optimal solution is an oversampled polyphase filter bank. There's a little bit more work in the front end, but it still fits in the same FPGAs, so that's almost a non-issue. Um, then we prune out the overlapping spectrum, do the fine, the secondary fine filter bank, and get a nice flat response. And here's one more slide that demonstrates with actual signals going through the digital back end. Seems simple, but a lot of work went into developing and designing that um, oversampled polyphase filter bank. Very challenging from a signal processing algorithm designer point of view. Here's a look at the actual digital back end. There's one side, um, HPCs with GPUs. Um, the RF sock boards are, are also in the racks. 
here's the other side with all the plumbing and the 100 GB, GB optical Ethernet links that connect everything. So now I'm going to leave what's been done in the past to um, how would all this be scaled up into a K-band phased array feed. Uh, look, looking more specifically at the, the front end themselves, the horn element, of course, that's the basic starting point. Um, another option is microstrip patch antennas. The advantage there would be ease of fabrication. Cost, of course, is not really the driver for a scientific instrument like it would be for a 5G um, cellular array or something like that, but it is something to consider. You know, we build these types of, um, you know, multi tens of gigahertz arrays routinely on PCBs and they're actually quite efficient and work well. Uh, there's another option. Um, a graduate student or a group a few years ago developed a stack shorted annular patch, but a picture is worth a thousand words there. That's something that sort of attaches onto a PCB and that combines the advantages of a planar fabrication, all the cost advantage of using PCB based manufacturing with um, as efficiency that compares to a horn array. So th these are some things that, that could or will be considered uh, when a K band paste array feed is designed. And then the first stage in the digital back end would be channelization, normally a polyphase filter bank. The alpaca approach is RF socks from Xilinx. And here I want to pause and sort of sing the praises of Mitch Burnett. He's sort of, he has many hats. He's a PhD candidate. He's the alpaca project engineer, full-time employed with that. He's also one of Casper board of directors. So he's very, very heavily invested in taking Casper into its next phase which is accommodating RF sock boards. Um, so here's the capabilities of the current generation of RF sock technology, eight inputs, five gig sample digitizers, or we can double that and lower the rate a little bit. The actual RF bandwidth that these can accommodate is up to six gigahertz, meaning we could use baseband subsampling to go to higher intermediate frequency if we wanted. Limitations, really the main difficulty is getting all the bits off the RF sock over ethernet. Um, there's basically a linear trade-off between the, the bit resolution, bandwidth, and the number of analog inputs. On-chip memory is also a challenge that limits the number of course channel polyphys filter bank uh, outputs we can have. There are of course alternatives to RF socks in one of those we saw in Kevin's presentation. Um, some of the newer array-based instruments being developed around the world use custom hardware platforms. Um, you know, FPGAs can really do more than just the channelization as I'll show in a later slide. There are some future technologies that you can't buy right now. Um, 400 GVE would be the natural next step. There are 400 GB uh, you know, internet technologies. We don't yet have those for RF socks. Um, there are accelerators that are, that are faster, kind of in the GPU family that, that hopefully will come out. Better protocols for getting bits from the ADCs into the signal processing. Intel hopefully is going to get into the RF sock game and create some competition for Xilinx. The big buzzword in chip technology is chiplets, putting lots of chip, chips in a chip scale package. And these things will be coming out roughly in the two to four year time frame, which really makes them feasible given the realities of funding and developing the K-band phased array feed. And again, I'll pause here if anybody wants to make a comment or ask a question. Any comments from the audience or on Zoom? One on Zoom. I'll pop up the next slide. After frequency channelization comes the beamformer correlator. GPUs are really capable. They can handle the task no problem because we distribute the workload over many. Um, consumer grade um, GPUs would work fine. We find that the gamer boards are cheaper and better than the science boards. The giant science boards are just more expensive. Um, GPUs really though are IO bound, getting the bits from the FPGA through the network switch through the CPU onto the GPU is one of the main bottlenecks. Um, yeah, that, that's a big issue. It's, it's workable, but really that's the limiting factor. 
alternatives. Um, CSIRO in Australia and some of the SKA development universe are moving some more functions on the FPGA than, than our group is doing. The F FPGAs can do more with, with careful programming. The challenge there is that FP FPGA development time is much longer, maybe 30X general purpose programming like you do on a GPU or a CPU, but people are doing it. it. It works and it is maybe a little bit more efficient use of the hardware. Uh, PCIe 5 will overcome some of the GPU to CPU uh, um, data interchange bottleneck. So we're looking for some improvements there. Here is a straw man design based on all of those considerations from the earlier slides for K-band. Uh, 192 elements, 384 total ports, 160 digitally formed beams, integration time and number of bits given there, 2.5 gigahertz bandwidth. Um, we would do either digital tuning, in other words, moving the bandwidth over the RF input bandwidth of the RF SOC ADCs. Um, that allows some flexibility in, um, in, uh, in, in tuning. We do some of the tuning in, in digital, and some of the tuning in the analog front end, where both are possible. But again, we'd be taking two and a half gigahertz and moving that over K band. Hardware, uh, 48 RF socks, uh, multiple RF socks per board, network switch, uh, well, one or a couple of standard uh, internet backbone network switches, 80 GPUs, using the Alpaca architecture, two GPUs for HPC, that'd be 40 HPCs in several racks. As GPUs get more capable, we'll do more per GPU. And hopefully the actual K-band phase array feed design would actually require fewer than 80. Reconfigurability, uh, keeping in mind the difficulty of software and FPGA gateway development, in theory, you can do a lot of different things. These digital backends are, are very flexible, keeping in mind basically a linear trade-off when it comes to the IO bottlenecks. Here again, I'm, I'm touting Mitch Burnett's work and the collaborators that he's been uh, working with. Um, RF, the RF SOC boards are fully Casperized. They're now in the framework. I have actually other research projects where students are using RF SOCs for radar. Uh, communications, uh, naval uplink downlinks, drone tracking, and so forth. And we're using, you know, Casper type hardware and software, and, and it's become quite flexible. You can see a list of some of the things that Mitch Burnett and his collaborators have brought into the Casper fold in the last couple of years, support for a lot of different platforms, high-level synthesis, where you can more flexibly program mm -hmm. uh, uh, Casperized FPGAs, et cetera, et cetera. Here are some, I'm getting down to the end of my presentation, but here are some things that I would like to do in further research. Uh, we need to look into beam, beam form of stability. I would like to do a K-band phased array feed prototype based on our communications world designs. We would just take one of those, redesign a little bit, fabricate it. We would have something fairly easy that could be put on the GBT for calibration stability testing. Um, this is probably my favorite bullet in the whole presentation because this is what I get to do personally. We have a really nice custom in-house code that can model phased array feeds from small to large on a variety of dishes, uh, including GBT, um, single optics, double optics, and so forth. The only thing that I need to do is put the uh, secondary in the model so we can do modeling of the K-band phased array feed. And I'm kind of excited about that because it's not administrative doesn't involve emails, just, just me and, and the fun work that I like to do. Sim simultaneous multiband sampling. I'll explain that on the next slide. This is a proposal that I submitted. It wasn't funded, unfortunately, to the NSF, but with a, we have a really good um, cutting edge uh, CMOS mixed signal designer. We're proposing an architecture that can take a broad RF bandwidth into a chip analog and output digital bits corresponding to discontinuous subbands. So we call that simultaneous multiband sub subsampling. If that were to be funded somehow, we would hopefully have a chip available that we would use in place of the RxSoft digitizer because it'd be a much more efficient way to cover K-band with reconfigurable flexible subbands. That brings me to my last slide. Um, a lot of research questions, which I just listed. 
My main point is that really a K-band phase array feed, like all phase array feeds, is a little bit of hardware and a lot of software. And that's both good and bad. It, it takes a lot of software work. Um, the Casper framework, though, mitigates a lot of that. You can, we, we can use the open source development team to help us solve problems, provide uh, software blocks that are pre-made that can be used and so forth. I'm done with what I have to say. So this one, I'll just stop and, and then turn it back to the audience. Okay, thank you, Carl. So if we have any questions here in the audience. Yes, go ahead, Ron. Um, you didn't mention one specification, which is the um, uh, uh, range and frequency, res frequency resolution that you um, will be able to provide. Now, Kevin, in his presentation, gave 30 kilohertz, which is half a kilometer per second, which I don't think, for some of the science I've seen over the last day, might not be enough for those who are interested in velocity structure or subthermal line widths. So what, what kind of line width, what kind of frequency resolution are you um, um, thinking of being able to provide? Sure. Uh, with the two-stage channelizer, um, the first channelizer precedes the beamformer, and the beamformers and GPUs, that architecture actually makes it really easy to deliver um, finer spectral resolution because that's done distributed over many GPUs. In fact, we could go to the uh, several kilohertz range that Alpaca is doing. It's the, it's the same bandwidth of Alpaca that we had in mind when we spec'd out the straw man K-band phased array feed. Really the only limitation of going to a finer spectrometer in the second stage filter <clears throat> bank is getting the data off the GPUs and onto disk. Um, but really, we could go very fine, kilohertz scale. Any questions here? Go ahead, Pedro. Um, I guess a question for both you and, and Kevin. I, I was a bit uh, surprised by the difference in instantaneous bandwidth that you both were proposing. If I got it right, you were saying 2.5 gigahertz, and Kevin, you were pointing out at 400 megahertz. What's what's the difference, and what's the actual, I guess, upper limit of a realistic upper limit of how wide you could go instantaneous? I'm not sure if Kevin's booting up to comment there. I'll just quickly say that ours is driven by the current RF SOC maximum five giga samples per second. So we half that down to two and a half as the instantaneous bandwidth and ran those numbers through to spec out, you know, the 80 GPUs and so forth. And I'll maybe hand the baton to Kevin if he wants to say more. Yeah, I mean, when it comes, you know, like the, like the GBT spectrometer, you get to just play with those windows because it doesn't actually matter. You know, you're not correlating other things with other things, right? Whereas here, you literally every single one has to have the exact same bandwidth because then you're going to multiply the signal from each one with each other. Uh, and so, you know, uh, you're stuck with like the RF SOCs. Right now, the max they're going to do is two and a half gigahertz. Uh, and that's probably the best, you know, current technology. For, um, you know, the one I had is now five, more than five year old technology. So, you know, that's the I, I want to be fair to Kevin. His rack was way smaller than the rack that this system would fit in. We're, we're talking, you know, five or six standard size racks. And I think his was much smaller. You know, the whole thing scales linear with bandwidth. Hey, go ahead. Um, I have a question about, so are the questions that both of you are kind of trying to propose to solve or like, uh, proposing new technologies for, are they more for overcoming like the existing mechanical issues or are they like for looking for new science? It's like something I, I didn't understand the question. Can you maybe re ask that again yeah. so I can understand it better? Oh, um, I was wondering if like the things that you're proposing are they more for overcoming like uh, current existing mechanical issues or hardware issues or something, or if they were more for like uh, attempting new science? Oh, okay. So in terms of my field, the antenna and phased array world, really we know everything, almost everything we need to know for the K-band phased array feed. Um, there's a little bit of interesting work in designing the array itself, but we're not breaking new ground there. The calibration stability is a little bit interesting. We'll have to 
figure out something there. But really, to be honest, we're not breaking a lot of new ground in terms of the antenna design and the array design. We're, we're at the point where this is pretty much a known quantity. Now, if you had in mind the K-band science, you know, I'm just waiting for someone to say, we got to have this, you know, it's a must have. And then I go to town building technology. I do, I'm, I'm here to learn about the science. I know very little about it. Did I at all answer your question? Please, please expand if, you, if you'd like to ask more. No, that was, that was helpful, thank you. Any further questions in the room? We have to, oh, you go ahead, Ellie. Yeah, so I was just curious um, about kind of how the beam solar aspect, uh, beam forming aspect is going to work. I apologize, I don't know if I'm going to apply that one too. But um, so I guess I was just kind of curious what either like software, software technique you're going to use to actually do this beam forming. Um, because uh, yeah, I was just familiar with the programming on I think Zoom Radio. There's some people through that project are working on developing potentially a beam former, um, but uh, that's I think still pretty early stages if it's even been started yet. So I was just curious kind of how that would work. So the question was, what's uh, what software would you use for the beam forming technology? Um, if that sure. encapsulates your question. Yeah, for a phase array feed, there's two ways to do beam forming. One is kind of the Cadillac approach because it maximizes flexibility and power, but it's more costly. And the other is what we actually do. So the best mode in many ways would be to correlate all the outputs and store them like you would in a synthesis array. The problem is that's more compute expensive and the data product is much larger. Um, the, the advantage to correlation is we would store the correlations and the observer could post-correlation beamform the data in a variety of ways. Now, that sounds really nice in practice, the flexibility, but it's also kind of a bug because they, the observer has to beamform the data and make that decision. It's an extra step. So for that, plus the computational cost reasons, the way we actually beamform is those GPUs have a stored set of coefficients, beamform calibrations, and it's doing a multiply and sum um, so, so the, the software is really quite simple, you know, multiply and accumulate, and then the beam outputs are ran through the fine correlator. So that's, you know, that, that's the simplest part of the software. It's really just one line of code embedded in a much larger line of code, which is really just handing the data around between array elements and GPUs. But please expand on the question if I didn't, if I didn't really get the whole thing. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Thanks. All right, do we have any questions on Zoom? All right, if not, we'll go ahead and thank Carl again. Thank you.